Good morning, I'm Andrew Topf with Investing News Network. I'm here at the PDAC show, joined by Chris Grove, who is the Director of Corporate Communications for Commerce Resources. And Commerce Resources is exploring for tantalum, niobium, and other uh, rare metals. Uh, today we're focusing our discussion on tantalum. So, Chris, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, so, tantalum is a fairly obscure metal to some people. Can you explain what uh, tantalum is and uh, what it's used for? Um, probably the, the best answer would be that tantalum is the fundamental backbone of all electronics produced today. Besides also being uh, the metal that is alloyed in to produce the hardest uh, steel alloys known. The steel alloys that cannot have any metal fatigue such as uh, the steel that would be found in jet turbine blades. So uh, tantalum was always alloyed in to make things like jet turbine blades uh, but about 75 percent of the market for tantalum goes to the electronics world and its largest uh, percentage of use in the electronics world is then used used for capacitors. So maybe some of the viewers weren't around when the Motorola Dynatac came out in 1983, which weighed 28 ounces and which was affectionately known as the brick. But in the redesign that took six years for Motorola to come out with the StarTac or the MicroTac, which represented a 22 ounce reduction in the size of the product, uh, what had happened in there, besides other things, was that they had swapped out the aluminum and ceramic capacitors for tantalum capacitors because they found that tantalum has the highest capacitance and that is defined as the ability to hold more electricity per gram than any other material known. So tantalum has been the backbone of the electronics industry for its capacitors since at least 1989. However, tantalum is also used in other ways in electronics. It's used as a firewall between, between the two halves of a semiconductor and then Intel has uh, a, their own proprietary way to use tantalum in their microprocessors. So uh, you know about 75 percent of the tantalum market goes to electronics and arguably in all the continued design and manufacturing of electronics, tantalum is absolutely essential. You really can't uh, design or manufacture a piece of electronics these days that does not have tantalum in it. Okay. And so tantalum is um, sort of inextricably tied to the, uh, the trade and conflict minerals coming out of the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo. So it's a sort of a variation of the blood diamond story that a lot of people are familiar with here in the West. So can you give us a brief explanation of why and how tantalum is smuggled out of the DRC? Uh, sure. Well, um, ever since the Rwandan genocide in 1994, the Rwandan uh, uh, rebel group that perpetrated that genocide moved west across the border into the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And basically, they just oppress the Congolese people. Um, that conflict in the DRC has been called several different things, a, a civil war. Um, it's not really. However, uh, both the government uh, military of the DRC and these Rwandan rebels do the same thing, which is basically uh, the United Nations has a great term for it. It's mining by military motivation, which essentially means there's a guy with a gun, an AK-47, telling a kid, uh, a child of eight or ten years old, or a guy with one arm to go and, and pick up the tantalum-bearing minerals. And then these minerals are now, you know, collected and then sold. And, and, and this brings us, uh, and this has been going on for 19 years, basically. So the United Nations started reporting on this in 2001, 2002, and essentially all of the companies that use tantalum were implicated in the first United Nations report in 2001. And many companies were successful in getting off of the 2002 report. However, that was really the beginning of the, you know, the, 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 the smuggling of this DRC produced material. That really hasn't changed uh, up until until maybe a year ago. So August 2012 was when the SEC came out with their ruling supporting the conflict minerals legislation in the Dodd-Frank Financial Reform Bill, which was signed into law by President Obama in, in July 2010. I believe that this has actually changed the market. And the bottom line is, and where the rubber meets the road, is, is that any U.S. listed company has to file an annual report with the SEC stating where they and their suppliers source their tantalum from. Now, the United Nations uh, has 
you know, limited resources. However, the United Nations also has more people on the ground, more uh, peacekeepers in the DRC than in any other jurisdiction on the planet. And the estimates vary from 18,000 to 22,000 United Nations peacekeepers in the DRC. So you can get an idea. It's a significant problem. Now, the smuggling uh, by the United Nations reports has increased significantly. But that's the thing. There's no real clarity on it, except that the United Nations group of experts says it looks like smuggling has increased to places like neighboring countries like Rwanda. Now the reality is, is that Rwanda has no primary production. There is no company that is producing tantalum out of Rwanda right now, nor Uganda or any of the other neighboring countries that border on the north, uh, sorry, the northeast corner of the DRC. So the smuggling, uh, for all intents and purposes, has increased. Now, personally, I've been to Asia three times last year, and the last time I was there, I met two companies that, in my mind, clearly understood that they. They need to change their procurement policy so that they can continue selling their tantalum powder or their tantalum metal to U.S. based customers. So you, you mentioned the, uh, the Conflict Minerals Act which puts some of the responsibility on electronics companies. Do you think that that will, how far do you think that will go in t terms of stopping the trade of, the, of illegal tantalum? Well, um, it's, it, you're, you're, everything is, is at as such a distance, let's put it that way. The reality is, is that uh, the Chinese processor I met uh, outside of Guangzhou in November of last year, they were historically the largest uh, uh, um, uh, processor that was delivering product to the United States. That processor is not being, their material is not being bought in the United States right now. So uh, it has changed the market. Now, ultimately, yes, the onus uh, falls upon the electronics companies or the other companies that use tantalum that also have a U.S. listing. That's correct. However, those companies are way down uh, uh, the, the production chain. You know, and so way upstream here, you have still the material being produced probably in exactly the same way it's been produced for 19 years. However, that material may not have the market it used to have and that seems to be clear right now so in terms of the interest our developing tantalum project has seen in 2013 which is an increase of interest coming from the Western users of tantalum I would say that the conflict minerals legislation and the SEC ruling supporting that have changed the market so that essentially anyone that does buy that conflict uh, that conflict material is not necessarily able to sell it as easily as they used to be. Right, okay. So outside of the DRC, where else is tantalum mined? Well, the, the biggest single source of production right now for tantalum, uh, besides the DRC, and that's very hard to quantify, mm -hmm. but besides the DRC, it's probably Brazil. And I would say un almost undoubtedly it's Brazil. Now, the confusing thing about Brazil is it has a, a, a few projects that are similar to our asset in British Columbia, which is to say they're carbonatites, which is to say that they're really a, a co product situation with niobium and tantalum. And that is what our project in British Columbia is. Now, the, uh, the projects in Brazil typically have a little bit more niobium than uh, the ratio we have in British Columbia, without being too self promotional here but uh, Brazil would probably account for somewhere around you know a million pounds per year right now but it's, it's hard to get any clarity on that as well because a lot of these companies are private companies uh, there is an interesting situation though with one of the Brazilian companies which is called Campania Industrial Fluminense in that three of the world's largest tantalum processors all say that they have an exclusive contract with Campania Industrial Fluminense so obviously there's at least a couple of people who may not have an exclusive contract with CI Fluminense. But uh, uh, Brazil would be the biggest producer right now. Uh, second to that, uh, the Canadian operation, which is called the ta uh, Tantalum, Mine, uh, Tantalum Mine of uh, Canada, Tanco, that is back into some kind of limited 
limited production. Now, uh, historically, Tanko only ever produced about 200,000 pounds a year. So I'm just going to guess and say that maybe they're producing 100,000 pounds per year. Australia, which used to be by far the dominant producer in the West, which used to account for about 2 million pounds per annum, is basically down to maybe 50,000 pounds a year right now from a small producer that produces tantalum as a byproduct named Galaxy. And so uh, besides that, there's a little bit coming out of Mozambique, maybe 20,000 pounds a year right now. So, um, and I think that's about it. Okay. Um, so, for investors interested in uh, tantalum companies, what, what criteria should they use to evaluate a good project? Uh, well, uh, you know, certainly you could rely on the 43101 legislation to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that all jurisdictions don't use the 43101 uh, um, legislation, but our project, uh, you know, has a 43101 compliant preliminary economic assessment. And so, you know, as a child is encouraged to do with their mathematics homework, you can see all of the data there. You can see the cost that AMEC uses, the, or the value that AMEC uses for tantalum, for nitrogen. You can see the costs that AMAC have, have estimated. So it's very transparent. You can look at all of the data and you can see that our production scenario is the largest in the world. So uh, a conservative estimate of our production scenario, which is in the preliminary economic assessment, would see us producing 700,000 pounds of tantalum per year. That is the largest production scenario for a tantalum project in the world right now. Besides that, if you want to look at another project to compare, all I can say is, is that, you know, uh, hopefully you'll be able to find information on those other projects. Some of the projects out there are very difficult to find information on. One of the areas that is of interest, I would say, is a company called Tanta, Tanta Line and, uh, oh no, sorry, Tantalus. Tantalus, and they are a German listed company and they're active in Madagascar. However, it's very difficult to get any information on what is going on there. It looks like they are developing that asset, but I really know nothing more about it. And I do, you know, try to keep on track of these things. So I, I guess in general, I would say, you know, look at the publicly available information on any of these companies and then try to compare yourself. Just as a reminder for investors, what's the name of your project? Oh, our project, um, it's the Upper Fur Tantalum and Niobium project in the Blue River set of claims we have in British Columbia. So the actual project is called the Upper Fur. Okay, great. Well, Chris, you've uh, been very illuminative of uh, some of the, the projects that are out there, some of the regions and some of the issues regarding Tantalum. So I appreciate you joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I've been Andrew Topp for Investing News Network. Thanks for joining me.